Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Dr. Judith Herman, in her classic work, Trauma and Recovery, the Aftermath of Violence, From Domestic Abuse to Political Terror, which we discussed last week, detailed three stages to recovery. In the first stage, the survivor focuses on the complex and demanding task of establishing safety in the present, with a goal of protection from further violence. Safety gives the survivor the space to recover from the terror that reduced him or her to abject submission, and to regain a sense of agency. In the second stage of recovery, the survivor revisits the past to grieve and make meaning of the trauma. Out of this grief is forged a new identity that does not deny the past nor allow it to define his or her identity. As Dr. Herman writes, social support is a powerful predictor of good recovery while social isolation is toxic. People cannot feel safe alone, and they cannot mourn and make meaning alone. The third stage sees the survivor refocus on the present and future, expanding and deepening his or her relationships with a wider community and the possibilities in life. Some survivors see their own suffering as part of a much larger social problem. They join with others, including other survivors, to work to build a better world. Robert J. Lifton calls this a survivor mission. In Dr. Herman's new book, Truth and Repair, How Trauma Survivors Envision Justice, which we will discuss today, she adds justice as the fourth stage to recovery. If trauma is truly a social problem, she writes, then recovery cannot simply be a private individual matter. The wounds of trauma are not merely those caused by the perception of violence and exploitation, the actions or inactions of bystanders, all those who are complicit in or who prefer not to know about the abuse or who blame the victims, often cause deeper wounds. Full healing, she adds, because it originates in a fundamental injustice requires a full hearing within the community to repair, through some measure of justice, the trauma survivors have endured. Joining me to discuss her new book, Truth and Repair, How Trauma Survivors Envision Justice, is Dr. Judith Herman, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and co-founder of the Victims of Violence program. So last week we talked uh, about the effects in particular of Uh, incest. Uh, We talked about the importance, as you write in your book, of uh, consciousness-raising groups and how vital that was to your own work. Uh, I want to talk now about how people pull themselves out of that uh, trauma. Uh, What are the mechanisms that uh, they use to recover and uh, we mentioned some of them, so let's let's go through them, and then let's talk about. And I fully agree with you that 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 a, a vital link that is often overlooked is a sense of rebuilding a society where justice is at its core, especially for those who have been victimized by abuse or injustice. Well, I think the the take home message about the harm of trauma is that it shames and isolates people. And so recovery has to take place in relationship. Um, When people feel reconnected to their communities and reaccepted in their communities, then the shame is relieved and the isolation is relieved. And that really creates the platform for healing. Um, So uh, one of the things we discovered early on 
from a therapeutic point of view, and this applied whether we're talking about combat veterans or whether we're talking about incest survivors uh, or rape survivors, is that putting survivors together in a group uh, often was tremendously healing and therapeutic. And the, the Vietnam veterans against the war developed what they call rap groups. Uh, and when Robert J. Lifton studied uh, 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 Viet Vietnam veterans, he did so um, by getting involved in, in uh, leading rap groups. Um, sometimes they were self-help groups, but uh, he as a psychiatrist uh, and as what he called a witnessing professional offered his services to facilitate people coming together. And, uh, and the combat vets felt understood. They felt they belonged. They felt other people got what they had been through. Uh, whereas they weren't sure that civilians could. Uh, and similarly with sexual assault survivors, um, in the company of other survivors, they, they felt not only understood and accepted, but they also felt they had something to contribute. Um, so they weren't just in the, in, in the position of seeking help damaged people see, seeking help, but they had caring and compassion and understanding to offer others. And, um, and that was also very liberating. There is a difference, though, as you write in the book, between the way society views veterans, we accept their trauma, and the way uh, women who have endured sexual assault are viewed, you quote, uh, was it Catherine um, uh, McKinney, is that right, about how ra rape, rape is not funny, rape uh, in the United States is, uh, is, is not uh, prohibited. I think she uses the word, it's moderated. It's regulated. Regulated. <laughs> regulated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, if, if a, a blonde, virginal white woman is raped by a black stranger on the street. That is a felony. And the um, justice system, such as it is, will spare no expense to track him down and straight him up. Um, but that's not what most rape is about. Most rape victims are assaulted by people they know. Family, friends, bosses, uh, dates, uh, ex-boyfriends, etc. cetera. Uh, and most rape is intraracial. Um, uh, of course, white, black women are much more frequently raped by white men than the, the converse. Um, uh, so, and, and in those cases, it's, well, what was she wearing? And why did she go to that party? And, you know, how many beers did she have? And why did she accept a ride home? Well, you talk about the court system and how uh, traumatic it is for rape survivors to enter into the court system because the uh, defense counsels will rip these, I mean, will consciously provoke, re provoke the trauma that it's really awful. And um, of course, most cases never even make it as far as a court. In fact, most cases aren't even reported to police. The high end estimates are maybe 20, 20 to 30 percent of sexual assaults are reported to the police. 
because most women know that they will be treated as suspects rather than victims. Um, uh, their cases will be blown off. Um, uh, and even if they uh, are properly investigated and uh, do result in a prosecution, uh, uh, I, I like to say that if you if you wanted on purpose to design a setting that would exacerbate the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, a court of law would probably be ideal because it's an adversarial system, it's a hostile system, pretty much any uh, amount of uh, verbal cruelty is allowed. Uh, and um, and the victim is just a witness. Victim has no say over how the proceedings are, whether or not the, the charges will be brought and how the case will be presented. Uh, so, and, and of course, uh, since reminders of trauma worsen the symptoms of PTSD, having to confront one's perpetrator and then be cross-examined, uh, not to mention facing the physical threats that may uh, come from the perpetrator or his friends or his family. Um, it's pretty scary and pretty, a, a, a lot of survivors talk about the second rape in the justice system. One of the things I found fascinating from your work is that they don't necessarily want money. It's not money they're seeking. No, and it's not punishment. Um, I mean, I, for my new book, I interviewed 30 survivors um, of various forms of gender violence, um, 26 women and four men um, who survived childhood abuse, uh, domestic violence, sexual trafficking, sexual harassment, sexual assault. Um, and I chose that group because it's the, both because those are the people I've worked with all my life and also because in terms of prevalence worldwide, uh, the United Nations estimates that just gender-based violence is the most common and endemic human rights violation in the world. Um, but my argument, uh, I, I think, applies in any situation where the dominance of one group over another group has, is, is a matter of long-standing tradition, whether that's based on race, caste, class, religion, or gender. Um, but no, the, uh, the, the stereotype of survivors is that they're going to want revenge. And that's why you can't, uh, you know, uh, why the state has to be the injured party rather than the than the survivor in criminal court because uh, uh, the survivors will just be out for blood. But in fact, what everybody I interviewed wanted most was truth and repair. They wanted the bystanders, the, the, the community, to validate, to, to recognize the truth of their story not just the facts, but also the harm that had been done. Because the you know backup argument is always, yeah, it happened, so get over it. You know, uh, why are you still whining? Uh, and so the the facts, the harm, and the wrong, the fact that this was a crime, and they want the shame put on the shoulders of the perpetrator rather than on their shoulders. Um, beyond that, what they really wanted was for the community to 
do what was needed to help them recover and to prevent this from happening again. And so they wanted the community to step up to set limits on the offender and make sure he couldn't do it again. But beyond that, they weren't big on punishment. You even, you even had cases in the book of women who don't want. There, I think there was a case where she just had, there was a symbolic. She wanted the perpetrator to pay a symbolic fee of $30 to a rape relief center. They didn't even want the money. Well, a lot of uh, survivors will feel very conflicted about, I mean, just to be clear, in, in, in criminal court, the, the justice, the metric of justice is punishment. Uh, in civil court, the metric is money. Uh, and it's, the, you know, the, the standard of proof is not as high and the scales are more balanced because the offender is not, the offender's liberty is not at stake. But the metric is money, money damages. And a lot of survivors felt very mixed about it because on the one hand, um, they'd spent a fortune on doctors and therapy and lost, uh, lost opportunities. Um, like dropping out of grad school. Um, and on the other hand, it felt like dirty money. It felt like they didn't want to feel like they'd been bought. And this was especially true for women who'd been trafficked right. and had actually been bought. And um, no, what they, uh, the, the, the survivor you quoted was a, an artist who was raped by an ex-boyfriend when she went to his apartment to retrieve some of her artwork. Um, and um, her case was turned down for prosecution because, I mean, she did report to police and the prosecutors didn't want to touch it because, you know, they had had sex before. So who he said it was consensual. consensual. Uh, so as he said, she said. Um, so she sued him in civil court, uh, and uh, the, she wanted him to give thirty dollars to the rape crisis center because that represented the thirty pieces of silver for which um, uh, Jesus was betrayed. And I said, "But he told me he had a lot of money." Why don't you ask him for, to give them $30,000? Right. He said, I, I, I didn't think of that. Yeah. You know? So, so yeah, the, the idea that survivors are just out for the money, that's a sexist stereotype. I want to talk about forgiveness. I had a great professor uh, uh, who told me only God forgives. Uh, and, and you quote uh, David Constant, the classical scholar, who talks about that issue in his book, uh, Before Forgiveness, The Origins of a Moral Idea. Let's talk about forgiveness. Well, that's the other thing that most of the survivors I talked to were not big on. Um, they, there were a few um, who, to whom it really mattered. Um, but, um, I, I I like to quote one of them who was a is a Protestant minister, um, Anne Marie Hunter. She had been herself a victim of domestic violence, and now she works with clergy to try to get them to take this seriously and not just advise the women to turn the other cheek um, to keep the peace in the family, um, and. She said, rather than bringing victims to forgiveness, let's work on bringing perpetrators to contrition and changed behavior. She said, a lot of forgiveness, it's just so much easier to pressure victims to forgive and forget 
than it is to actually confront what needs to be done to change the culture so that, you know, this behavior is not as endemic as indicated in the statistics you quoted. Um, um, but some survivors really cared about forgiveness and they meant two different things by it. There were the very rare survivors who felt that forgiveness had happened because there had been a true reconciliation, a true I and thou moment where the perpetrator had been remorseful and had apologized genuinely and had made amends. And when that actually happens, it's very rare. But when it happens, it's very forgiveness is like a spontaneous emotion. You don't have to work at it. It's just um, one survivor I quoted a young woman named Rosie McMahon said it was just like I was I just was lifted out of my chair. You know, it it, um, it was such a relief. Um, But for many other survivors where that was never going to happen, um, they worked hard on, what, on forgiveness. And what they meant by that was sort of a unilateral letting go of resentment and anger and um, uh, bitterness. Because they felt, they often felt as though that kind of anger and bitterness was a kind of a residue of the offender's hatred in their, that, that they were stuck with. It was like a foreign body. Um, I'm not a hateful person. I, um, uh, the artist, I quoted who wanted the, the, the 30 pieces of silver um, returned. A woman named Amy Bradford, she described how she would have these nightmares in which a dinosaur came and stomped on the rapist. And in the, in the dreams, she was crowing. And when she woke up, she felt terrible. It was like, I'm not that kind of person. You know, I'm not a violent person. That felt awful. Um, so for many survivors, they worked on letting go of their anger and rage and so on um, and, and bitterness. And But that, um, in the absence of any apology or amends, um, that was a long process of grieving and letting go. Well, you write, forgiveness must be earned by the practice of repentance. It has to be earned. Yeah, yeah. Well, and as I learned from David Constant's book, it's not in the Bible. No, it's not. It's um, uh, interpersonal. I mean, God's forgiveness, yes, but not interpersonal forgiveness because in the Old Testament view and early New Testament views, um, only God had the uh, wisdom and understanding to recognize true remorse and true repentance. Um, and therefore, only God had the grace to forgive. And uh, we should also add that Incest is also not condemned in the Bible. Well, there's that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are so, it's there a mixed are, bag, the Bible, <laughs> having studied it at Harvard Divinity School. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, under certain circumstances, if the father's seed, you know, the, the, the needs of the patriarchy are paramount. Let's put it that way. Let's talk a little bit about how I, I remember um, Melissa Farley once saying that 
the trauma that you experience in war, and this is excluding moral injury, which is its own category, which you write about, but the trauma that someone like myself experienced in war is finally not comparable to the trauma of a woman who has been raped because our bodies were not penetrated. Would you agree? Well, uh, strictly speaking, I don't think that's always true. Um, well, no, it's not. But but let's say that distinction is made. Would you agree that the trauma is worse? I I hate to get into this right. comparative who's trauma right, right, versus right. business. Um, I do think that the, the trauma of sexual assault for men and women is of a different order of magnitude from physical soul, say, um, because of the degree of humiliation um, involved, um, not just the physical pain, but the, the um, def defilement, if you will, that um, the, the level of hatred and contempt that goes into a sexual soul. Um, but, um, but in general, I think the, it's, it's a zero sum game. This, right. this trauma is worse. Uh, this is one of my favorite paragraphs in the book where you compare the Roman Catholic church to the sex trade. Go ahead. Uh, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with you, by the way. I'm totally with you on this. <laughs> well, just in terms of international scale and international wealth, I think they are comparable. Well, but also in terms of what they've done. Well, there's that. Uh, yes. I mean, we're not even getting into the Inquisition and all that, but um, just the more current practices. You do bring up towards the end of the book this, you always put it in quotes, sex work. Yeah. Uh, and I remember interviewing Rachel Moran, who wrote her book on prostitution. She had been a prostituted woman, and she said it was like being raped for a living. Um, and you're not buying, I think correctly, the kind of fashionable embrace of quote unquote sex work. Can you talk about that? Oh, sure. Um, I, I think this has been a debate within feminism for a while. Um, and there are, the, I think there are good intentions on both sides. I mean, I think there's a desire to destigmatize prostitution by calling it sex work and just comparing it to any other kind of work. And also, uh, but the policy consequences there would be full decriminalization, which means um, criminalize, not only decriminalizing the prostituted person, the person who's being sold, but the sex industry, the, um, which is an international criminal organization. Um, that preys upon the most vulnerable women and children um, of both sexes. Um, but who, who are you often, usually people of color, poor people of color? People of color, people in poverty, people of color, and abused kids, runaways. Um, I mean, a pimp can spot a runaway, right. you know, at 100 paces, and, and they, you know, they... They, their recruitment techniques are all about, you know, promising to be the daddy they never had. Um, well, you talk about it. You liken it to the way cults recruit. No, they use the same methods, of course, of control. Love bombing at first. Um, and then very quickly, um, you know, the imposition of the same, the same methods of, of, course of control that torturers use and you know that that I mean violence but also control of the body, you know, what she eats, when she sleeps, what she wears, uh uh 
forcing uh, people to do things that they find dirty and this degrading, um, and then isolating people from any other sources of support. Um, uh, and you know, I mean, they teach each other the same methods, the same way clandestine police forces in our CIA taught dictatorships in Latin America. There's the same methods. Um, so, uh, so no, I do not think that is uh, that the sex trade is harmless, and I do not think it should be decriminalized. Uh, and I have a lot of good data backing me up. A number of countries now have followed uh, another policy which decriminalizes the person who's being sold, but still criminalizes the pimp, the, you know, the brothel keeper, um, and, the, and the John, the, the sex buyer. Right. This is the, Nor- this is the Nordic... This model. is the Nordic model pioneered in Norway, Sweden, uh, and now adopted in several other countries. And they have very good outcome data. Um, whether you're talking about diminishing prostitution overall, diminishing violence against prostituted people, diminishing murders of prostituted people. Um, and whereas the, the countries that have gone with um, you know, basically licensing brothels like Germany and the Netherlands and so on. Uh, there's been no diminution in trafficking or violence or murders. Great. We're going to stop there. That was Dr. Judith Herman, author of Truth and Repair, How Trauma Survivors Envision Justice. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, David Hebton, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.